The public has a long-held fascination with detectives. Detectives see a side of life the average person is never exposed to. In this podcast series, I Catch Killers with Gary Jubelin, I will be interviewing real detectives, taking the audience into their world, a world that is rarely seen by the public. I spent 34 years as a cop. For 25 of those years, I was catching killers. That's what I did for a living. I was a homicide detective. I'm no longer interviewing bad guys. Instead, I'm interviewing detectives. The guests I've selected are the cops I consider real detectives. Their business was catching bad guys, and they were prepared to go into a world where pressure, risk, and sacrifice was the norm. These are their stories. Welcome back to part two of retired Detective Superintendent Ian Lynch's appearance on I Catch Killers. If you missed part one, Ian had recounted his involvement in some strange and bizarre investigations. Today, Ian will continue on with his stories about some fascinating murder cases and also his involvement in investigating notorious pedophiles. Ian will also give us some thoughtful insight into modern policing. I hope you enjoy. Let's get back to Ian now. Well, you um, you raised another matter. Uh, you said uh, this was bizarre, but you had uh, one that uh, is out there as well, a, a, a crime. Are you referring to Eddy Street? Is yeah. That yeah, one? yeah. Did you want the to... open and shut case? Yeah, a well, case to remember. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to uh, want to talk us through that one? Oh, if you'd like to hear it. Yeah. Okay. Because that that, that again is bizarre. Uh, it was about 1990. I mean, 1993, 1992, a woman's body was found in one of those striped laundry bags buried at Berry Island at Wollstonecraft. And that's on uh, Wollstonecraft? Ah, uh, north side, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, just behind North Sydney there. Yep. It's a reserve, it's a headland which has been turned into a reserve. And uh, you've got to cross a park to get into the bushland at the end. Yep. So the, the body was buried in, in, the, in the bushland. Some kids playing cricket, they'd hit a ball into the into the trees, went in to get it, saw this half-buried bag, poked it, and the bag started to bleed. Yeah, uh, then yeah. they've looked inside, so cops get called, and we get, I got called out at 8 o'clock at night. I was at the Rag and Furnish, I think, hotel at North Sydney at the time, so I wasn't far away. Uh, there's a woman in the bag. She's very, very badly decomposed, and um, very small, but basically she's just all folded up. No appreciable injuries to her, and... We were only able Clo- to... Was wearing clothes or...? Yeah, she was... Yeah. Uh, I don't remember now. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And, no, she wasn't. I don't yeah. think she was, no. We were able to identify just a single fingerprint from her. And the single fingerprint identified her as Dawn Street, and she was from Victoria. She had been the victim of a sexual assault where her husband had been charged. And... All reports from Victoria is she they'd taken off together and were living mm. in um, in Sydney. Anyway, we traced the husband down Eddy Street. Um, at that particular point in time, he was living at Annandale, and uh, he basically stated he hadn't seen her for I think it was a period of 17 days. Then they'd had an argument, and she'd left on the night that Cocoon the Return played on the television set, on the, on the TV set. You remember that why? <laughs> it was important at the time. <laughs> maybe you should have been an account. Yeah, maybe, you? yeah. <laughs> Debit the receiver, credit yeah. the giver. Um, profit and loss. We did a canvas around his house and we had about half a dozen people that said, oh, yeah, I've seen this, that's Eddie and Dawn, yeah, they hang around here all the time. Uh, one person saw them a week ago, one person saw them three days ago. Anyway, one person said four days ago I saw them yeah, together. Yeah. And um, Eddie's saying, no, 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 I haven't seen her since the, you know, for 17 days. Anyway, then we went to a pharmacist uh, doing the canvas, and the pharmacist said, oh, yeah, that's Eddie and Dawn. He said, oh, I wouldn't believe you. He said, I sold Eddie a camera. A uh, what, um, sorry? A camera. Yeah, yeah. And Eddie, Eddie was a bit of an herb. He's got cards in different names. and yeah. He was an alcoholic and um, although with these bloody things, you've got me worried now. Um, I'm not enjoying it. you early morning uh, drinking I'm, habit. I'm not enjoying it. I might yeah. point that out. So um, we said, have got any photos? He said, yeah, sure. So he puts the photographs out. And there's various photographs of Eddie doing this, Eddie doing that. And there's a photograph of Eddie in his unit. 
playing up for the camera. Yeah. And in the background, his wardrobe's open, and there's the striped bag. <laughs> you could so <laughs> you could even line the stripes up. <laughs> so you've got the striped bag where the body's been found at the park. The body's in the striped bag. Yeah. And then you've got the photo, Eddie, doing his selfie yeah. or whatever. Yeah. And there's a bag behind him. There's the bag behind him in the wardrobe. Some brilliant detective work. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That's why these things happen. Yeah. So we figured Eddie wasn't telling us the truth. Yeah. But we didn't have a cause of death. Yeah, yeah. Um, and if you haven't got a cause of death, you've got problems. So our inquiries then moved to Deep Creek. Well, they're happening all at the same time, but... A few things started to come from the Deep Creek Reserve, and one of them was a cab driver that came in. He said, look, I don't know how long ago. It was, it was about three weeks ago, which was mm. interesting. He said, I've got a call. I've picked a bloke up at Wollstonecraft Railway Station, which is just up the hill from Mary Island. And he's carrying a big blue suitcase. And he got in, and uh, I, dro- I drove him to Wannandale. Well, yeah. Where'd you drive him? And he shows on a map virtually outside Eddie's house. Yeah, yeah. I said, yeah. I, he couldn't identify Eddie. Yeah. He said, yeah, it was a strange call. He said, I drove the guy back and he said, uh, he said he'd been arguing with his wife right. and he'd pretended to leave home by taking his suitcase and going down to Berry Island. But he decided there's no point, so he was going to make up and just return home. That's what he told the That's taxi That's what he driver. told the taxi driver. And then he also said to the cab driver, um, do they have a lot of break and enters around that area? The cab driver said, I don't know. He said, oh, it's only it's while I was waiting for you. Uh, the cops searched me. <laughs> Strange. He said, the cops came past and searched me. Yeah. I said, oh, OK. All right. So we're working at North Sydney. Berry Island's at North Sydney. So I put posters up everywhere, sent emails ever. Has anyone spoken to someone in the vicinity of Berry Island? Yeah. Couldn't yeah. find anyone. Has anyone done any jobs down there that might be? Yeah. Can't find anything at all. And, and, and this is trying to get the information from the police, not the public. Yeah, this is yeah, from the yeah, cops. Yeah, yeah, so you're, you're yeah. trying to yeah, get the information from, the from our own. What's well, yeah. happened? Yeah. Anyway, we, we go on and uh, we're getting all these different reports about her still being seen around um, before, or oh, sort of in this period between Cocoon, the return and the finding of the body, 17 days. And Eddie's still saying no, uh, she left on that day, haven't seen her since that particular point in time. <coughs> and from a decomposition point of view and the, yeah. the maggots and everything, that, but although there was in a bag, it's sort of making a little bit of sense. Mm. Anyway... And uh, sorry, because you, you mentioned the maggots, and that might confuse people. But oh, yeah. that's often how we we tell how long a body's been hmm. been there by uh, examination of the maggots and the the temperature, and we can have a rough calculation based on that. That's right. Yeah. But again, we've got people saying four days, and he's saying seventeen days. Science is sort of telling us seventeen days. Yeah. Common sense, if you saw us, it's that seventeen days. Yeah. Right. Okay. So we have a sighting of her. So again, it's all starting to. Well, it's going different directions uh, a yeah, little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here's someone, here's science saying she died on this day. Here's a nun who can verify a story in some respect. Yeah. Saying she was alive the next day. Yep. Here's all these people saying they've seen her in the interim. Mm. Um, yet the science and the decomposition, yeah, it's pushing yeah. us back that other day. So. And we still don't have a cause of death. Yeah. So without a cause of death, you can't charge someone with murder. Mm. Even though we knew he had the bag. Yeah. It's a strong circumstantial case. But in the end, we looked at it all and we said, well, look, we know he had the bag. Yeah. There's this cab driver that's dropped, a, dropped yeah. him straight outside. We didn't have the, yeah. the, 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 the journey there, but we had the journey back again. If we can find a pair of sky blue stretch pants, it says she's left, probably wearing the stretch pants. Yes. She's come back. Yep. And he's got the bag. The cab driver's taking him back. We might have something for tampering with hormones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is the best we've got. That is the best we've got. So at this stage, he's moved to Enmore, so we decide to search the place at Enmore. And and tampering with remains, again, just to uh, to explain that, uh, it's an offence that uh, if you're uh, moving human remains around, it's not obviously not murder, but, uh, yeah, tampering with remains. We didn't have a cause of death, so we couldn't charge anyone with murder at that particular point. Time. So, yeah, it was, it was just a very, very perplexing case. Anyway, so we go to his place at Enmore, four of us, and we went simply because it was convenient. And another day, someone wasn't working. We took the van because we thought there'd be a fair bit of clothing there. So, so you went to his place. Did you have a search warrant or...? 
No, it was a voluntary search. We, we, okay, we were so getting very knock well. On, knock on hey, the so door. Knock on the door. Fine. Yeah. Do you Hi, how are you? How are you? Do you mind if we take some of Dawn's clothes? Yeah. Um, we're, yeah, we're looking for a specific item. He said, yeah, no, help yourself. Because at this point in time, he's got to present himself as the... He, he's the, the cooperative spouse. Yeah. Wor yeah. Worried about what's happened to worried his Worried about wife. what's happened, yeah. yeah. But a little bit annoyed because cops keep coming around and make messing his house up. But you're, So you've gone around there looking for those... Pair of blue stretch pants. Right, OK. So there are clothes everywhere. Yeah. The place is, in short, a pigsty. Yeah. We're going through the stuff. Let's look, Eddie, we're going to pick this stuff up and take it somewhere else. Can we borrow one of your suitcases? So he goes, yeah, take the red one. And he's looking very nervous. But anyway, sorry, I'm, I'm going ahead of myself. While we're looking around, suddenly there's this blood everywhere. Blood in the house. There's blood in, the, in, this, in this room. It was a boarding house. Fresh, fresh blood, blood old blood. Well, dried blood, but there's yeah. a lot of it. Yeah, yeah. What's, what's all this blood doing everywhere? He says, oh, last night I cut my hand. I cut my hand. Yeah. And sure enough, he's got a big cut in his fingers. Right. So, okay, so you've bled a lot. He said, oh, yeah, mate, yeah, I'll lick up my hand. I was really bad. Did you get it? No, 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 just wrapped it up. I said, yeah, all right. It's got cuts here and cuts there. They don't sort of quite align. Okay. And um, we continue the search. Red suitcase. Open the red suitcase up, and it's the only, it's the neatest part of the house, and it's absolutely yeah. chockers. Yeah. I said, mate, well, look, this is, with respect, the neatest part. Just put that aside. Yeah. We'll use the blue case. It's bigger. And then I thought the blue suitcase. I thought we hadn't thought of that before, but the taxi driver said he had a big blue suitcase. Right. So I've opened the blue suitcase, and it was a zip up one, and I've zipped it partially. Mm. I still get freaking, freaking out when I do this. <laughs> I unzip that. I'm getting And used inside, fun. there's another suitcase, and it's a latch suitcase. Mm. So I open the latch suitcase, and there's a body of a woman in the suitcase. Another body. <laughs> another body. I <laughs> Okay, stop right there. <laughs> how, how did you feel with that? Oh, I'll never forget it. I, if you see Felix the cat when he gets a fright and he's hanging on the seal, <laughs> I just virtually put my, I virtually put my head I, through the seal. I want you to be honest. Did you scream? <laughs> Yelp. I know I swore. <laughs> okay. All right. Fuck me, Dad, I think was... Yeah. was, was, was that the is, most uh, that, thing. I, I, Look, that's something. And, and you... you, you Proceed with caution when you're in a suspect's place and you're looking and... But opening up a, a bag and seeing a body in there, that and must a, have... Uh, yeah. a, an open and shut case. <laughs> you were never funny. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, you were... Possibly you could have been an accountant. <laughs> a case to remember. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I just I can jump through the how, how long had the body been there for? Was, was the smell associated with it? No, uh, no, no. no. It transpired he'd had a domestic argument with his very small, very petite girlfriend who was part Aboriginal, yeah. but looked quite similar to his wife. Right. So exactly the same build yeah. that night. And that's where the record of the interview was um, unusual. Uh, what he claimed was that, well, needless to say, we, we secured the crime scene. Yeah. She'd been killed the night before. Right. Um, he went to Newtown Police Station. We're dealing with a crime scene. I think it was Jeff Bell had him at the police station. You said he, he won't believe it. He's just confessed to killing his wife, Dawn yeah, Street, the yeah. first one, which we had no cause of death over. Right. So, oh, OK, well, start writing things down, getting things done there, get that done, leave the crime scene. Um, again, I, I was getting all these media people have got photographs of me walking out with gurneys with suitcases and bags on them at this particular point in time. <laughs> anyway, um, we go back to Newtown and he makes full and frank confessions about murdering his wife with a pillow. He suffocated with a pillow. It had a dispute. He, he thought somebody, she had a boyfriend, just a, a normal woman. He's put the pillow over her head. He suffocated her. Um, so what am I going to do with this? Put her in the bag. Got the cab driver. Said, I've been fighting with my wife. I want to yeah. go isolated. We never found that cab driver. Went yeah. to Berry Island Reserve, took the bag out, buried it, caught the cab back, as we as we suspected. What had happened? A car fire had been occurring on the street yes. that night. Yeah, yeah. He'd seen the cops as he's walking back up the road. Yep. As he's waiting, a cop searches him. Who was right. the cop? Oh, I don't know. Just a cop. He pulled up. Was he by himself? Yeah, he's by himself. Yeah. Who, who is this mystery cop? We don't know who this mystery cop is. Anyway, we we, we do that interview. In relation to the body we've just found. Um, that's his current girlfriend. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's the worst case of suicide you've ever seen. 
Um, so you could, yeah. They had an argument. Yeah. She's pulled the knife out. She stabbed him herself five times in the aorta, among other things. Yeah. All essential organs around here. Plus, somehow managed to put a knife in the middle of the back. And that's the story you're selling. And that's the story you're selling. But what, in fact... And oh, then they've... He's pulled the knife on her. They've made up. They've had sex. Yep. He wakes up in the morning and she's cold and unresponsive next to She's dead. That's his story. But what's happened? He stabbed her in the back. The knife was in the garbage bin. The blade is bent. It's a kitchen knife. Mm. As he's, the knife's hit the bone, his fingers have continued to slide down the blade. That's how he cut his... And when he goes like that with his hands, yeah. all the cuts align. Right. So, yeah, so we had that one. Anyway, so we had a... We charged him with two counts of murder. It was a... a, a very, oh, yeah. We then do the runaround. There's always a twist to your stories, <laughs> Lynchy. We then do, do the runaround. A straight murder. So after we get these two, we get one. Yeah. Confess murder, one worst case yeah. of suicide you've ever seen in your entire life, which just doesn't add up yeah. at all based upon the injuries we have and yeah. what he's saying. As we pull up to do the run round yeah. at the um, at the Berry Island Reserve, as I'm driving in, a sergeant at North Sydney Police Station looks at me and goes, as the car pulls in, and he gives me this funny look and then starts running towards me. Oh, get out of the car. You spoke to him. Yeah, 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 I spoke to him a few minutes. That was a missing, said, <laughs> missing policeman. Did you see the email? No, no. What, what did you do it for? He said, oh, oh he said, uh, oh, there was a car burning down the road and I was just checking on the cops. And yeah. as I've gone down there, I've seen this guy and I thought I'd search him. He said, did you make a cops event? No. It's bizarre, Why didn't you it? make a cops event? Okay. Anyway, so that, How, that damaged yeah, an ID. Yeah. And that, 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 that led to a, a yeah. fair bit of controversy at the trial. Anyway, so he was, uh, he was ultimately convicted of, uh, after a very lengthy and drawn-out jury, uh, length, lengthy drawn-out trial, and jury was out for four days. He was uh, convicted and he got life term, ten murders. Yeah, a, a, a bizarre, isn't it? The, the, the logic behind the murders, why it happens, and, and you come across that, and it, it makes you question human nature, doesn't it, when you, you speak to people like that? Uh, and you think, what is going through their minds? Uh, but then we, as we search the place... After we found the second body, we find an electricity bill. And he's rung Newtown Cops yeah. the night before. Yeah. And then after that, he's got some... So we went to Newtown Cops, and he says, yeah, he said... Um, he's told the sergeant there, I've had an argument with my girlfriend. Yeah. Um, she's taken off, and I'm worried about her safety because her previous boyfriend said he was going to kill her. Right. <laughs> Twist and so turn. we think he was getting ready to... Got yeah. the body in the vicinity of the, the boyfriend, so. and then say, "Well, I, I told you so." Yeah. Yeah. yeah, But, and then there were a whole lot of various things he said, which we were able to disprove in terms of where he went that day. Yeah, what witnesses across the road saw, um, doing his kung fu exercises early in the morning when he said he was out. Yeah. So yeah. And how did how him, did that uh, um, investigation did that change you or impact on you or? Well, see that photograph there. I've got hair there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at the photo. I think that was the. Uh, I think Jump. that was the start of the process. Because this is a podcast, What's your and people excuse? can't see the photo. But What's your excuse? I work very hard, eh? Mm. <laughs> um, oh, yes, no, sorry. You I'm... do look remarkably younger there. Yes. Yes. But um, yeah. I oh, know. No, look, that really shook me up. That, I was having freaking nightmares. The wife rang. Um... And the way the cops would deal with it, and I'm not being critical of them, but they wouldn't deal with it. People no. would just go, "Oh yeah." My yeah. wife was so. Concerned, she rang the police psychologist. And the psychologist said, "Yeah, oh look, come in if you want to, you know." Well, but then we all yeah. knew you had to be careful of yeah. reporting things like that. And I was well, doing a job I loved. Yeah, well, that, they that, would drag you off it. Yeah, that, that's the thing. You 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 couldn't show weakness. If yeah. you showed weakness, they, uh, you would get moved to moved aside. It took me a long time to get over that. I'll say it's just yeah. a simple thing. But I, I can remember about three times during my career where. You walk in on things. One was a, a suicide with a shotgun. Oh, it wasn't a suicide. It was another murder when I was at Darlinghurst. Yeah. Um, a fellow had shot his wife while she's clutching a baby mm. with a shotgun and hit the baby. And we were the first into the scene with the ambulance. The yeah. baby's on the floor and this woman's head's all over. And because you just don't know what you're walking into. Yeah. Another yeah. one was a robbery at King's Cross Rex. Same thing, a shotgun. Yeah. 
and you've walked into the... Uh, so there's been a robbery, people streaming everywhere. You run to the safe if you come to and there's this person with that ahead. Yeah, I and, know. Uh, it's just... when you walk into those things... You know, you, you get used to being bodies, but when you yeah. walk into something and you're just not used to it, you just... Something... There's a mental switch. Yeah, yeah. And the, the adrenaline... Get ready for it. You're ready for it. Yeah. And if you're not ready for it... Yeah, yeah. No, you can see how it impacts. I, I found with homicide as confronting it was, we had a role to do and that helped me. That helped me mm. sort of, you got to the scene, but you had, you just switched on the work mode. That's went, right. You know, decomposition, I'd, I'd seen plenty of that sort of stuff. It's, but it's just when you're not prepared. And but I there, really wasn't expecting to find a body in the there, scene. There's case. another one and you, you touched on it, I'll just meant the, uh, mention the name and I, I'd completely forgotten about this one, but I think it's one that you and Richo did. And I know mm. Richo has spoken about the Fernando brothers, is yeah. it? Yeah, that, that uh, murder of the nurse up at... Uh, Walbert. Yeah, that, that was a horrific one. I, oh, I, a shock. I, I, just, I, I remember talking to Richo after he came back from that one. It's Glenn Richardson, a yeah. work colleague of ours. That, uh, and he said, yeah, it was just one of those really felt low and bad about it. It was a nurse at the hospital that was uh, abducted and... Um, well, while we were investigating the um, the Ezzardine Bar Mad, the, the, ta- the cab driver yeah, yeah. Um, at Collaroy Plateau, a, believe it or not, he used, to be, he used to be a teacher at my school. He was my rugby coach. Peter Jenkins, who was a right. since died, but he was a detective at Tamworth at yeah, the time. Yeah. And he had an informant who said that two Aboriginal men had returned to the community at Walga and were bragging about having been involved in the murder of a cab driver in yeah. Sydney. So Glenn and I and a couple um, from um, DY, we went up to Walgan. I'd never been to Walga. Yeah. I think I've, I've been back a couple of times doing the brief, but I don't think yeah, I've ever yeah. been back to Walga since then. And um, so we went up there to find these two people. We had names. Yeah. And I think the first day we were out there, we found one. Yeah. Brought him in. He's confessed to it. He said, oh, he said, no, I didn't kill a cab driver. He said, we didn't, we didn't kill a cab driver. He said, what happened is they'd done a um, robbery on a florist. Mm. Excuse me. They'd done a robbery on a florist's. And the two fellows that they had done the robbery with knew the cab driver that had been murdered. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was the connection. Yeah, yeah. So we charged this fellow with the uh, home invasion. Yeah. And we couldn't find the other fellow. Yeah. So we were going to return the next night, all finished. We stayed at Walgut that night. Yeah. Three o'clock in the morning, we get woken up by the local detectives. Can you give us a hand? A nurse has gone missing from the, the Walker Place Hospital. Yeah, and, and look, just so, so people understand that and just to get the sense there, you're up in Walgut, which is, a, a those that don't know it, is a very isolated uh, town there northwest of uh, uh, New South Wales. Yeah. On another job. Yeah. And you're asleep. So doing what detectives do, I know I've, I've spent many a time at the country town. You, you're off there with your work partner or whatever. You go to the local pub, you have a meal have a couple of beers and, and go to sleep and get ready to travel or do the work the next day. So I'm assuming you're, you've done that yeah. and you're staying in some local pub or a hotel uh, somewhere and you get a call at 3 a.m. in the morning. It wasn't a call, they were knocking on the door. Right. Okay. Yeah. 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 They were in, can you give us yeah. a hand? The, the, yeah. the nurse has gone missing. What's the chances of that happening? Oh. Like, you know, when you're in town. So It was just a period in my life where yeah. these things were happening all the time. It was a busy time, wasn't it? <laughs> so... We go to the police station, we speak to the, the staff, we, we start getting some searches, and some, but still dark. Mm. We get some necessary protocols done. Richo and I go to the hospital, and the only witness is, uh, she's working in the paediatrics unit. Sorry. <laughs> I'm, no, just, not I'm, I'm going to clarify yeah. what the tapping and stamping is. You're yeah. not in the police interview room. I'm just trying to recall, yeah. it was the aged care section of the hospital, and right. she was there by herself. And the only witness has has Alzheimer's. Right. And he's, what did they look like? Yes. Yeah. He looked like Mal Meninga. They yeah, looked like yeah. two Mal Meningas. So we yeah. go to where he was sitting and on the poster, yeah. on the wall is a Mal Meninga poster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we just had nothing. Yeah. There were some footprints on the um, on the floor. You can see that's so what we kept off the floor. Um, I said, well, look, we've, we've, we've really got you know, very little to go on. At this particular point in time, we got the two detectives up. We um, basically uh, absconded a couple of aircraft from the uh, aerodrome 
Yeah, yeah. One was a crop duster, and one was a bit bigger. Could take a couple of people. We put right. the detectives in the in, the, in that in there to have, they knew the area. Right. Go up and have a look along the rivers because yeah, yeah. Walgett is at the junction yeah. of a couple of rivers. If they've picked so her up, so just uh, the circumstances of her disappearing from. She was working there on her own at night? Or? On her own, yeah. at this hospital that was connected to the main part of the hospital. I yeah. mean, it was by a covered walkway. Yeah. Totally isolated. Yeah, that, that was basically all we had. We went, I said, we, we need help. So we went on the local media and said, start coming through. Yeah. Um, there are a number of one-man stations around. So yep. Start checking cars that are coming to see if there's a woman in a car. Yeah. We didn't have a formal power to search cars. Yeah. yeah. We were just looking for... There, 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 there seems to be yeah. a case where a woman may have been abducted. Um, the aircraft returned. They hadn't seen anything yep. of any... They hadn't seen anything on the, um, on the riverbanks. Yep. Um, and then, of all people that came in, a, a kangaroo shooter who was a half-baked tracker came in. Yeah, yeah. And he said, oh, look, I'm, I'm not bad with tracks. I can help you. I said, OK, well, help us. And... We we found out a car in the car park. Yeah. Her car had been broken into. Yeah. And some cassettes and some stuff yeah. had been stolen. And following from that, he, he followed tracks and he went to a dirt road that was at the back of the hospital. Yeah. And he located, I'm just trying to think how it worked, three sets of tracks walking down the road. So he, the, couldn't, the, he couldn't find out where they left or where they went down. Yeah, yeah. But there were these three tracks of uh, going down the road. Anyway, we thought, well, most of the people lived on the other side of the road. Yeah. So we went up and down the road and found out, found other tracks. So this, this is an amazing story. You're a homicide detective from the city. Yeah. You're up there on another job. You get a knock on the door at 3am in the morning about someone who has disappeared. And... You've gone from the city checking CCTV footage to yeah. now you've got a, a person following tracks. That's right. Amazing, amazing. And then we followed the tracks. We, okay, so we went up the road, like to the right from the hospital, I suppose that's south. And we followed the, the, the tracks across the road again. And they continued on, but there were two sets of tracks. We didn't know what we had, but it was the yeah. only thing on the road. Like, yeah, yeah. It's, well, there's nothing happening yeah. in this particular part at the back of the hospital. The aerodrome was on the other side, yes. but it was just bush. Yeah. So we followed the two tracks for some time and we came to uh, the levee bank. Yep. And there we found some torn up cassettes that came from the car. Yeah. Cassette labels and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are a number of footprints that are around the place, one that went to the dam. And the ones we had coming back the other way also went past the dam. So... The nurse was the fiancé of one of the local cops. Right. So it was particularly emotional. Um, th- he had been bitten in an arrest and he'd been living at the police barracks mm. and he was waiting for an AIDS test to come back. So we didn't know what level of friction had been occurring in the relationship. Right. We know he was very worried yeah. about yeah. the test. So there was very little, given what we had, we could be saying to anyone. Um, and yeah, and, this and she'd gone to work. From a detective's point of view, you can't reveal too much. You're no, on the investigation. You know. we don't know. Like he, he might be a police officer, but that certainly doesn't exclude him no. from being a uh, suspect in the matter. No. And you're in the local, very isolated country town, and you've yeah. got the local police. It, it would have been a difficult situation. It was. Yeah. And then we kicked the media thing off very, very quickly, and we just had a huge reaction. Yeah. And I'm dealing with telephone calls from deputy commissioners and stuff coming in. I'm a detective senior yeah. constable. And all this stuff's pouring in. And uh, in the end we said, well, OK, we've got the... The tracks might be wrong, we don't know, but they've led us to this thing. Let's do a search between there, mm. uh, between the hospital and the levy bank where we found the stuff. So we start a search through there because a lot of cops had come in from surrounding areas. At this stage, the local crime squad's been... The Northwest Crime Squad at that stage had been mobilised. They're on their way up. We've got the dog squad coming in terms of yep. uh, searching trails and stuff. We had the air wing coming up. Yep. Uh, and I remember the, uh, the dogs put their dog on a helicopter to get there quickly. And they were halfway there. And they get called to return because the helicopter's not good for the dog's ears. 
So that was another delay. <laughs> yeah, this is the sort yeah. of stuff you... I, I, can't, just... I can't believe you didn't factor that in. Eh? <laughs> I, I, I mean, if you're running an operation, like yeah. you should have allowed for that. We just had all these logistic issues. And in the interim, we got the two detectives and people who'd been in the area for some time. And one of the detectives we'd bought from D, DY was Mal Cochran. Yeah, I who know. Who was an Aboriginal footballer. Yeah, yeah, a, 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 a top um, rugby player. And they flocked player. to him. Yeah. They flocked to him. So they all went into the town just start talking to people, shaking yep. up the doors. Anyway, about halfway through the morning we got a call. There were two people, the Fernando brothers, and they, were, they were cousins. Um, cousins, I think. Yeah, they were, they were cousins. Yeah. Brendan and Vesta. Mm. Fernando. Vesta had left some respite home or something. I can't think now. It was a, it, He was supposed to be as part of a sentence. was supposed yeah. to be staying. He'd absconded. They saw them in town last night. Yeah. They had machetes and they said they were going to um, break into some cars at the hospital. Right. So we saw all start looking for those yeah. people. That, that's looking pretty good. Yeah. Um, the dog squatters arrived. I remember the car had driven so quickly, it was virtually just steaming. It looked like yeah. it was ready to fall apart. Yeah. The helicopter arrived. Yeah. The heli- helicopter refuelled. We're still doing our search from the hospital to the levee bank. Yeah. The helicopter takes off. And it says, we've just located a body near the right. airport. Okay. So we have didn't have radio. Yeah. But the helicopter, followed, yeah. physically, we followed the helicopter, yeah. Joe and I, back to the scene. And here's this poor woman. She's just about being decapitated. And she's, uh, like, she'd obviously been sexually assaulted. And they've thrown her on an ant's nest. Yeah. yeah. And there was this black soil. And there'd been some rain. Yeah. And the tracks in that particular area were very evident. There's three there, yeah. three going away, down to the oval. Yep. And what had happened, in fact, they'd gone left rather than right yeah. at the back of the hospital. Subsequently, we were able to trace those trails. They went behind the, next to the oval. There she'd been raped. There were a pair of yep. hospital scissors and stuff and um, some clothing. She'd been sexually assaulted there. We were able to trace where they went over fences. Yep. They then crossed the back... Uh, they started heading south at that particular point in time. Um, subsequently, we heard that's when the cops had started searching. And when they'd seen the cops shining their lights everywhere, they murdered her. Right. And dumped her on an ant's nest, hoping to destroy the evidence. Then they continued to walk, headed back towards where they'd been living. And that's where we picked the tracks up as they crossed that road again. Yeah. Went to the dam. And this took us the sort of the first day. Yeah. That night... We arrested Brendan. Brendan made admissions, but he wouldn't go on the Eurus because yeah. he believed at that particular point in time that uh, it was going to take his... The camera was going to take interfere with his spirit. But he spirit. made... He made yeah. So we had the notebook. We didn't ask me more questions. Yeah. We just had the notebook read out to him and signed, signed. in front yeah. of an Eurus, yeah. on an Eurus. So yeah. it was as good as an Eurus. Yeah. And he basically confessed to he's invested in the work. Yeah. Uh, He was charged. The next day we drained... We are trying to take the attention away from where we thought the thing was. We drained another dam. To keep the media away? Because there were three... No, there were locals. There were 300 locals staring Ah, at us and watching everything we were doing. Yeah, yeah. We couldn't. We only had a certain number of people to guard dams, etc. So we um, we drained one dam in the afternoon and the next morning we drowned the other dam and we found the machetes. Right. Uh, And then the next day uh, Vesta was arrested in... Dubbo. Mm. And they both got life as well. I, I, isn't there a follow up to, to that story? Uh, that didn't they, isn't, hasn't one of them been murdered in yeah. prison? And Vesta, that, uh, Vesta, they both, oh, again, they both oh, got life. Yeah. They were cousins. They got life too. And didn't they mur- one Vesta mur- murdered Brendan in yeah. Lithgow Jail. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, bizarre. And now Vesta's one of those radical Islamic people in maximum right, security. Right, right. Look, I, I know I, I know that crime. Speaking to you, but also speaking to Richo, really had an impact. It was just a horrendous, uh, horrendous situation. But uh, also from a, a detective's point of view, just the range of different investigations. Here you are in a country town. I keep getting down to it, and you're using detective skills to follow tracks. Yeah. Like, a, a, amazing. Um, talking about all the uh, and you know, by anyone's standards, some of them are just amazing jobs for a homicide uh, detective. What uh, what you've done there, Lynchy? There's another job that you uh, you mentioned that said was interesting too. Um, what what was that one? 
Yeah, it was another Chatswood job. I don't know what it was about Chatswood. It was the water or something, but there was always something unusual happening. But um, a, I was asked to take a statement from a prisoner who'd been arrested in Queensland and extradited to New South Wales on a couple of armed robbery charges. And the statement um, was relative to a conversation he claimed he'd had with a, another inmate at Bogger Road Jail in Brisbane um, concerning a, a hired hit, or a hired hit on a woman. It was a, a boyfriend getting revenge on, a, on, a, um, on, a, on his girlfriend. And um, he'd been basically asked to participate in this. And prior to extradition, he'd handed a note to one of the corrective officers there saying, you know, I've got information about this matter. So the Queensland cops just rang up and said, could you go and interview this person? So I interviewed him, I think, at Long Bay. And uh, he was a very dodgy sort of character. He, he was sort of all over the place. And he, he was quite strong in terms of what he said about this robbery. But anyway, at the end of the interview, he said, oh, you're from the Homicide Squad. One hand him a card. I said, that's right. He said, oh, I might have some information um, for you about an unsolved homicide in Sydney. So oh, that's good. OK. And um, which one? And he said, oh, I can't tell you too much because, you know, you had to look after me. You wanted to go to jail early. He said uh, it was to do with the murder of a dentist in the eastern suburbs. Yeah. A dentist's wife. I said, oh, OK, can you give me anything else? No, no, you go away and look that up and it'll, it'll make sense. What, what were you thinking at the time? You thought you were bullshit oh, I or? I didn't, didn't know anything. I just, yeah. OK, well, obviously it's something. I'll, I'll chase it up. Anyway, uh, I went back to the office and I remember I spoke to Mike Hagan. I said, have you heard? Yeah, Marguerite Edwards. I said, what? He said, yeah, Marguerite Edwards. And um, I looked the matter up and a few people had known, knew things about it because they'd actually looked at it as part of the granny murders investigation. Uh, and just so the people are aware, Mike Hagan is the detective inspector in charge of homicide. That's right. Yeah, at, he was in charge of the crime squad at yeah. Chatswood, yeah. So I looked it up and um, some years previously, and we're talking now, would have been the late 80s, um, a orthodontist from Wallara um, came home and discovered his wife uh, strangled in their walk-in wardrobe. And um, uh, her name was Marguerite Edwards and she'd been strangled with one of his ties. She'd also been um, battered around the head and the matter was, at this stage, uh, unsolved. So this was the crime the informant from Queensland had said he's got some information about. That's right. That's yep. right. So I got all my facts together, and in the interim, I, he couldn't wait. He was ringing me up, and uh, he wanted all these deals. And I said, look, you're, look, you're the person with the story. I said, you write down what you know, and we'll, we'll move from there. So I've got some record of what it is you're trying to tell me. So... He, was, he wrote down a, a five-page, maybe even more than now, five-page written statement. And every word that was of any significance in it, he crossed out. For, all for the, the sake of negotiations relative to him being an informant and reducing his sentence. And basically what he said is he had a girlfriend who worked at Surrey Hills. He had dropped her off to work and had, his, had her car as he'd done in most days, and he was drinking, I think he said, at the Foresters Hotel on Surrey Hills. There he was approached by a friend that he knew, and the friend asked if he could use his car to do a job. And by job, he meant some sort of crime. But he said, look, it's a break-in, and it won't be any dramas, I just need it. Anyway, so he said, yeah, OK, you can have the car to do the break-in, and he nominated the, the fellow. And then he said later in the afternoon, the guy came back with the, you know, from the car. He had blood on his shirt. He was panicked and he said, listen, everything's gone to shit. He said, drown what's in the boot of the car. He said, it's gone to shit, don't say anything to anyone. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so Lorenzo's gone outside. His name was uh, Christopher Lorenzo. And he searched the car and in the back of the car, he found a forty-five replica pistol. Which was interesting because 
a 45 replica pistol or a 45 pistol that looked identical was one of the weapons that had been used in this robbery, one of these robberies. <coughs> he said it was covered in blood. He said he panicked. Um, he then searched the car and on the ground, in the, on the floor of the car underneath the seats, he found a gold bracelet, a gold woman's bracelet. That's the information <coughs> that he supplied. That's what he supplied. Yeah. But he went further. He said when the police um, were chasing me relative to the robbery, they found the car, they found, they found the gun. And the gun is in fact sitting at the exhibits room at the Sydney Police Centre in Goulburn Street. Right. I said, okay. And that transpired, yes, it was there. Yeah, so you checked that out and found that was the gun. There. Yep. But he said, for insurance, I kept the bracelet and I gave it to my girlfriend. <laughs> were, you, so, were, you, were you starting to be a little bit suspicious at this stage? Yes. So we found his girlfriend and sure enough, she had the bracelet. And sure enough, the bracelet was part of a matching set um, that the deceased was wearing when she was murdered. She still had the necklace on, the matching necklace when she was killed. Right. But the bracelet had been removed and they were a matching set. Yeah. And the bracelet had been removed. And then he also said, in relation to the car, as further insurance, I removed the base plate of the magazine and hid it in the rear right indicator of the car. So we found the car, the girlfriend still had it. We looked at the right rear indicator and here was the base plate for the magazine, for the gun. Oh. That was still at the police centre. Jeff Beresford, if you remember, Jeff. Yeah, I know Jeff. Looked at the gun. The gun came up as a positive test for blood. Yep. Further examination revealed that the rear sights of the gun were identical to marks that were on the top of the skull, the right. deceased skull. Yeah. Um, and it was the... So just just to explain that, so the rear sights were identical? The rear sights, the groove of the rear sights, yeah. the imprint of the sights were in a... And they only had a plaster cast at yeah. this stage because she'd been buried. But were identical to imprints that were found on the top of the deceased skull, which indicate that the, the, the gun had been held by the barrel backhand and used to bludgeon her. Right. And it was because of those bludgeon injuries to her head that the Granny Task Force had been interested in the job. And those are not familiar with the uh, Granny Killer Task Force. That was where uh, uh, six elderly ladies were murdered on the North Shore and uh, they were struck um, from behind uh, right. with a hammer. Yeah. Okay. So I can understand why they'd be interested. Yes. Yeah. So needless to say, at that particular point in time, um, there seemed to be something in what he was saying. And we identified the person who he claimed committed the robbery. Um, he was living at Bondi. So we then conducted, after a fair bit more preparation work, and given the fact that this fellow was in jail, um, a, a, a very complicated covert operation down in Bondi, whereby this fellow was invited to visit Lorenzo uh, under the guise that he was staying at this hotel for a... Uh, for just, he was in Sydney. You know, just now, to catch I, up. If, uh, you can't see the smile coming on my face, but is this... So you've had to get the informant out of prison and if it's the one I'm thinking about that you didn't know how you would ensure that the person couldn't run away? Oh, yes, that's, I've forgotten that part. Yeah, so part of the strategy was to put a plaster cast on his leg and in the plaster cast was, and at this stage, it's before GPS, so there was no way we could sort of indicate it exactly, but he was led to believe that a device had been placed in the plaster cast. He was there when it was put in. It was just a, some wires and batteries and stuff called a spotulator. You gave it a name. <laughs> No, I think the Paddington detectives did. So he was of the view that he had a broken leg, he was in Sydney, he had a plaster cast on and he couldn't go anywhere because the spotulator would set off. And, and it worked. And when, 
I, I love innovative policing stories, so you put this person's leg in a plastic cast. Yeah. Okay. And told him that he had a tracking device <laughs> yes. in the plastic cast. Yes, but then we didn't have any tracking devices at that particular point. In time. Very anyway. Inno- very innovative. So um, he was given ample opportunity to speak to this um, person when he visited. Didn't take up the opportunity. Um, in the interim, I'd taken a statement from him where he confessed to a whole lot of crimes he'd committed to this particular person, uh, robberies and break and enters and drug dealing and stuff. But um, again, he, he didn't speak about those subjects, nor did he speak about the murder, which is primarily what we're most interested in. So after a time, we realised, again, everything was a deal. You look after me, I look after you. In the end, we were quite frustrated with regards to his efforts. And uh, we returned him to jail and we had another look in terms of where we were at. In the interim though, I should have said this earlier, we'd examined the crime scene and on a towel in the bedroom where she was found, there was a blood smear that was located. And the blood was examined and the blood they could say came was an unusual mix and it came from a group of people known as it was most prominent in a group mm. of people known as Cape Colours from Cape Town in right. South Africa. And Mr Lorenzo was a Cape Coloured. Right. From Cape Town in South Africa. He hadn't been born there, but that's where his family had come from. So there are a lot of indications. So at, at this point in time you've given he's given a very detailed version of a uh, a, a murder that is checking out with the physical evidence that you've got. Yes. You've put him in a situation, be it in a plaster cast on his leg, you put him in a situation where he had an opportunity to have that information corroborated. Yes. And he hasn't. No. And he's avoided getting it corroborated. Then you've um, looking, examining the crime scene and you found some, uh, 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 some blood that I uh, can't say definitively it is his, but the indicators are it could potentially be from him. Well, the, the indicators were that it came from a very, very select group of people of which he was one. Right, right. So uh, I'd taken a, a lengthy statement to him. I'd accompany him back to Queensland when he'd given his statement in relation to the, the other matter. And interestingly there, the jury didn't believe him. <laughs> um, so the jury system does work sometimes. <laughs> yeah. He was returned to jail. We were um, trying to work out exactly where we were going to take the brief at that particular point in time when a jail informant came up and approached another group of officers and said, I've got this fellow here who's confessing to a murder of a woman at Wallara. So an operation was set in place which um, involved a number of police from a number of different units By this time, Lorenzo had complained about us because we weren't forthcoming in helping him as a registered informant and he complained to Internal Affairs. So he was being interviewed in relation to that matter and a covert operation was set up in the jail and he's returned to the jail full of confidence after complaining about us and made full confessions to the robbery, to the the murder, even gave some detail that would have only been known to the actual offender. And uh, it was all recorded in the jail and he was subsequently charged with the murder. He was convicted. Uh, uh, once again, a bizarre story. <laughs> so an informant giving information about a murder. Yes. He's committed. And, uh, so yes, in fact, he was the offender. Yeah. And he'd, uh, uh, in an effort to have his sentence reduced in relation to some other robbery offences, he, uh, he gave evidence which led to his own conviction. It, it's a lesson to be learnt with uh, uh, less experienced police or just police starting out, detectives and all that, that when you're dealing with informants, you've really got to scrutinise the information. You have to be very, very careful. I, I, I think their credibility starts at ground zero and then they've got to build their credibility. Because, yes. Uh, otherwise, and uh, some of them are master manipulators. Oh, and uh, it would take some, uh, some uh, intestinal fortitude for him to think he can outsmart you by giving information about the murder that he's committed. But, uh, yeah, you, you, you've just got to be careful. Um, so that's your time, and I, I think we could probably cover another um, couple of hours of uh, cases that you've worked on in homicide. 
But eventually you left homicide? Yeah, I left... Uh, I was promoted to a sergeant's position at Major Crime Squad South and I left North. I, I really didn't want it. I loved the work there. It was, uh, it was a great group of people and um, uh, just, it was just a fantastic place to work. And I went to um, the Major Crime Squad South, initially in the Arson Squad. And at this stage the Royal Commission was in full swing and um, I was seconded ultimately, or very quickly thereafter, to a, um, uh, a task force investigating the activities of Philip Bell, um, who'd been mentioned in the Royal Commission as having undue influence with the police in the Northern Beaches. Now, uh, just again to bring clarity to the Royal Commission, this was the New South Wales Police Royal Commission. Yes. And uh, it was uh, a, a commission set up to identify corruption and, uh, and uh, other uh, activities within the police. That's right. And yep. Part of the, during the course of the Royal Commission, they identified some issues relating to uh, um, the activities of pedophiles mm -hmm. and uh, possible police involvement. Yes. Um, and you were seconded to a strike force to investigate the, the pedophiles. That's right. Oh, Philip Bell specifically. F Philip Bell. And look, now we're very much accustomed to um, uh, talk of uh, high profile pedophiles or uh, uh, pedophiles that uh, have lived their life abusing children have been very public. But back then, it, what, there wasn't a lot known about uh, pedophiles. And when you talk Philip Bell, the name resonates with me because it was something that wasn't really exposed in the public a great deal. What are you saying? That name rings a bell? <laughs> As I said, <laughs> Angie, your father was right about accountancy. You've made half-decent homicide detective, but I don't think you're a comedian. <laughs> yeah, all right. Um, look, I think there were a group of people who investigated child mistreatment and what they were investigating probably didn't in the then culture probably deserve the respect it now deserves. I think, I think we now look at, or I can say as of two weeks ago, we were looking at, um, it's been given a new level of priority. I think at uh, the State Crime Command, more cases of sexual assault than anything else. It yeah, takes up yeah. about two thirds of the, of the book work. Yeah. yeah, it's something I hadn't been introduced to before. It's a dirty, sordid job working with for the most part, dirty, grubby people and and poor kids that uh, um, will never quite be the same. So what was Philip Bell's story? Philip Bell was a, a wealthy insurance type person who lived on the northern beaches and for very many years um, had a proclivity to um, molest young boys. Worked it out to a fine art. He would pick his, uh, pick his target, the uh, if the child looked right, if it was from a, uh, if the child was in a single parent household, it was even better. Um, it was not beyond him to uh, spend huge amounts of money on the child. There was one child we looked at, he, he'd actually spent a lot of money doing his orthodontist work and coincidentally had gone to the same orthodontist whose wife had been murdered at Wollong. Of course there's a link. Um, yeah, he... Uh, he had a house at Whale Beach, he had a farm up the coast. He would take these kids away quite surreptitiously and, um, and for years and years and years just got away with molesting many, many children. And the matter had been looked at earlier by the, I think it was called the Professional Integrity Unit or something. Yeah. And for whatever reason, that prosecution had failed. And clearly the evidence of numerous um, witnesses at the Royal Commission indicated that this guy had been leading the, the life of Sam for years and years and years. Why, why, do you, why do you think it is that they could get away with it? Because it's fairly brazen when you look back at it. And uh, is it just that it was too confronting for <coughs> society I to... I think a lot of the victims probably at the time didn't report it. I think a lot at the time when they did, there were probably some police who could have done more with the information they received but didn't know for whatever reason. The, the extent of the problem I don't think was really exposed until such time as the, uh, the Royal Commission and exactly for how long and for how many people this person had been um, um, violating. So uh, I think there were just a whole raft of reasons but obviously his relationship with you know, certain police was such that it did come to the attention and certainly it had been a it, it had been a point of contention it appears in the northern beaches for some years anyway uh, he'd left the country 
prior to, uh, to us putting our brief together. So we went back many, many years and um, these kids were traumatised. There were certain things they couldn't remember. We found a lot of corroborative evidence. He used to assault a lot of people on his boat and then we'd, the boat was white and the boat was blue and some good detective work discovered the boat shed at uh, the northern beaches where he'd, um, where he'd actually had the boat converted and they still had mm. photographs of it. Yeah. So from that date, we're able to say, well, these offences on the white boat had occurred before that date, and the yep. dates after that was that date. So when you get little bits of information like that, suddenly you can... Uh, there was another one that was a pie shop at Manly. He used to buy people pies at Manly. We had the dates when the pie shop closed. And yeah, opened yeah. And there were a whole lot of things... So you could corroborate learn. the information that the victims had said to well, that's right. add credibility to it. There was, no, there was nothing to suggest these young people... Um, you know, they're saying they were bursting into tears because they said the pie shop used to be there. The pie shop used yeah, to be yeah. there. And sure enough, it had been there. It moved around the corner. Right. And we found the pr- original proprietor who was baking pies in Brookville. Yeah, yeah. Um, and this guy had just, he'd lived in the eastern suburbs. He'd lived in Whale Beach, wherever he'd gone for years previously. A- his farm. Trail of destruction. <clears throat> he had an IOU ledger at the local shop near his farm. Yeah, and all these yeah. kids had signed the, the ledger. Right. Saying okay. they'd been, the, yeah, yes. IOU. And, yeah. and these were the complainants. Yeah. So we had a lot of corroborative evidence, and uh, in the end, uh, of all places, we traced him to South Africa. Right. And uh, he was living at Jeffreys Bay in South Africa, same place where that surf was attacked by the shark. Yeah, Mick Fanning. Yep. Mick Fanning. And, um, uh, we, yeah, we went over there. He was arrested, brought back, and um, through, again, another lengthy trial. He, was, he got 14 years, mm. died in jail. What was his reaction when he was arrested? Well, he denied all the time that he was a pedophile. He didn't even think the word existed. He said, uh, I'm just trying to think of his exact words, he compared them to fruit. He said, uh, if, a, if a homosexual's an apple, a pedophile's an orange, he's neither of those. He's not gay. But he, just, he just has a fascination with young boys. Um, and he's always like young boys, building them into fine men and all this sort of stuff. Um, but he wouldn't admit to committing any sort of specific offences with them at all. Um, but anyway, the, the weight of evidence was such that, uh, um, yeah, we convicted him. He got it's something point. creepy about them that they justified in their own minds, isn't it? It's, uh... You speak to people like, well, he, he had actually, he came from a wealthy household and his parents believed he had homosexual tendencies and they'd actually sent him to a psychologist. Right, right. So the psychologist basically told him there's nothing problem, there's no, there's no issues, you know, you are gay. But he couldn't accept the fact that he was gay, I don't think. His parents couldn't accept the fact that he was gay and he wouldn't admit, or just, he said, I, 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 don't, I don't chase men, I chase boys. He right. was, I, he had a, he, he'd made up a specific word for it, I don't yeah, remember yeah. now in terms of uh, a heap of or something, I don't know, but that just meant he liked young men but he didn't do anything. Do you think he was offending when he was over in South Africa? <coughs> we know he was offending when he was over yeah. in South Africa. Yeah. He'd set yeah. himself up there, we had some covert work done and we know he was offending when he was in South Africa. Right, okay. He offended wherever he went. Yeah, well he, he's not going to change. How, no. how long did he get, do you know? 14 years. Yeah, yeah. Died in jail. Right, okay. Yeah. Yeah, the, remarkable. Um, your career? Well, then I went on to do some robbery, strike force, a Bagnara, and then um, I, I'm not sure I ever wanted to at the time, but I, went, I ended up back in homicide, serial yep. violent crime. We met again there yeah, at, uh, yeah. at Strawberry Hills. That, that was an interesting, uh, interesting time in major crime because, as we've talked earlier on, that uh, the squads were in regions. So you had the north region, the south region, and uh, divided up into the uh, uh, four regions. Yeah. Then they combine <coughs> us all together and you've got all these alpha male, alpha females all coming in and working under the one, uh, one umbrella. And, yes. Uh, when we first uh, remember when uh, homicide and serial violent crime was set up and we're at Strawberry Hills. The pecking you, order. Yeah, and you had the different... Uh, <coughs> personalities bouncing off each other and... Um, Where did your loyalties lie? <coughs> were you still a South region or a North region, I should say, or a South region I, when we came in? I was working with all the people from North region. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'd gone straight back there. Uh, they, they'd invited me to come back. I was a detective sergeant at that stage. Um, and that immediate environment was very good. But yeah. a lot of the other the, the other crime squads had been hit very badly by the Royal Commission and their numbers were down and depleted. Yeah, that's true. That's true. There were a lot of people that were off sick. I think if you remember, we had one room doing fresh homicides and we had another room doing old homicides and that was two people 
working on historical matters. No, yeah. that's, that yeah. was just the logistics of the time. That's why they had to do it. But it got to the point where there were two people doing a new homicide. Yeah, yeah. And that's... You, you can't run homicide investigations yeah. like that. You can't expect the same level of expertise in that specific crime at local area commands yeah. when they've got a whole lot of other stuff on their plates at any one mm. time. And you just can't drop down, you just can't drop off your general service to the public to deal with a specific murder. But again, I was part of a committee there, a couple of committees. One was the reconstruction of the uh, uh, of state crime. I was on a, well, it was crime agencies then. I was on a, a commissioner's advisory panel uh, as the expert referral, which was very flattering. So we got crime agencies up and running. Um, but then we had to put a separate application there. We even got a homicide squad. Yeah, I, I, I remember was... those days when they were talking about them. And, uh, <coughs> from uh, a homicide detective and seeing here talking to a homicide detective, it just horrified me the thought of not having a dedicated homicide squad because I've, I've worked homicide for 25 years. Every single day I came in, I learnt something new. Mm, uh, I know. It's just it, it's experience that you can't just manufacture. No, you, that's you've right. got to live and breathe it. Listening to your stories today, the type of experience you, you've got from the crimes that you've worked on, you can't invent that. You can't replicate that. You can't, you can't put it in a textbook. It's something you learn from experience, but you should... And, and later on in my career, I got into education. And, you know, all those lessons learnt, you know, we should be doing more with those things so we don't... The police force doesn't keep repeating the same mistakes, making the same mistakes. You know, we don't work in a... The world isn't sitting still. You know, there's huge changes in demography... There's huge changes in community attitudes. There's huge changes in technology with computers, social media, the internet. And, and that changes the environment. Well, and cops have got to go with those changes. You know, one, one thing I look at now with homicide or, or just prior to, to leaving and the concern I had was the uh, shortage of uh, analysts and the work that you need with CCTV footage, phone records, that type of thing. We've, I've, we've sat here today and talked about uh, you investigating a crime where you're following tracks. Yeah. You know, fo literally following footprints. Um, now, if there's a murder, the amount of data that you've got to assess, and I think that we've missed the point with the people that uh, are talking about how homicides should be run, don't fully understand the amount of work and the amount of time that's taken to go through just phone records, to go through CCTV cameras, and, and we've really got to adjust our thinking. Otherwise, we will be left behind. Your thoughts? I was fortunate enough to be chosen by um, Commissioner Andrew Scipioni because uh, in 2008, through a whole strange turn of events, I found myself as a superintendent at Education and Training doing specialist crime or specialist, investi specialist education. And cyber was something there which we started speaking to detectives about in the detectives course but it's something that was just growing exponentially. You could see it was just getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And in 2015 he sent me to the United States, the UK and Holland and um, then speaking to other people who have been over there, seeing the models that were in Singapore, in Hong Kong, uh, in Holland, in the Durham Police Force, in the Midland, West Midlands Police Force. There is a way to go about it but there's only a few police forces that have really got that on, on board. And as I said, I put a paper in, Yeah, didn't happen. There's a cyber squad and they're investigating some aspects of it. But uh, the model that's been used overseas is all those technical people work together under a mm. single command. And it's working there. I don't know. Uh, look, uh, I think we do drag our feet on, on things. Sometimes we play catch up and we should be ahead of the game, not, uh, not catching up. But... It's interesting getting your insight from it because you have been, and well, you have to be to be on the podcast. It's called Real Detectives. But yeah, thank <laughs> you, you very are, much. Are a, very flattering, by the way, Gary, very flattering. Are a real <clears throat> detective, but then moving into education and training, you retired as a, a superintendent, and uh, I think we need those operational police in positions up that fully understand what the work of a detective is. That's very nice of you to say so. I, 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 I agreed with that. Yes. Yeah. what That was my suggestion. And, and I enjoyed myself doing, you know, there. But as I said, you know, there are cultures. There's a culture in every police force and that sort of stuff's not sexy. Mm. Homicide's sexy. Education and training's not sexy. Yeah, yeah. Education and training takes people away from police stations. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, I think the people of New South Wales pay enough money 
for their police force to to want to have a good police mm. force, to want to have uh, to want to have professional police force. I yeah. mean, everyone's going to make mistakes, but we should be uh, learning on the lessons that we've learnt organisationally and doing something with them and getting the messages out. I, I, I think that's the crucial thing. Don't, <coughs> I, I'd never worry about someone making a mistake if it's made through genuine effort and it's a genuine mistake. But it's how, how you learn from those mistakes and, uh, and move on. And uh, when we look at homicides or reinvestigate homicides, and I'm, I'm, I'm horrified that uh, things that have been missed that could have been if, if people uh, you know, focused, on, uh, focused on things. Look, that's the negative side of it. Mm. Looking back at your career, mm. what was what do you consider the highlight or that time that you just thought this job rocks? Where, where did you really enjoy your, your time in policing? Oh, the five years at Chatsworth. Yeah, in the in terms of doing police work, I think that's as high as you could get, and it was in a terrific environment that was very very well led, um, as as distinct from managed. Yes, every place is managed. Some places are led, that, and that was led. That's, uh, maybe you ask, Mark, that's very insightful. That is very insightful, but you're quite right, because I'm, I'm trying to, that period of time in my career there in North Region, the homicide and that, you're quite right, we were led. It wasn't about management. You yeah. did the right thing because you wanted to do the right thing by the leader. That's right. Yeah, yeah. That's right. And if there was a problem that was coming your way, it went to them first. Yes. If they could solve it, it was solved. You just get on with your job. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, you're... Yeah, it was. A, it was. A, I mean, okay. Later on, various commissions said there were, there were issues. Fine, they happen everywhere. They still happen today. But in terms of getting the job done, that place was yeah. just fantastic. And getting the job done, honestly, I might steal your thoughts on that. <coughs> That's, uh, uh, I studied it last year at the uh, at the uh, Australian Institute of Police Management at, mm. uh, at Manly. Uh, leadership's an activity. Authority is just a rank. It's just yeah, a pay scale. Yeah, yeah. And the two don't. Always work together. And, that, and, and, and looking back at my time, that was you, you're quite right. Like the, the leadership that we had there, you felt comfortable and you felt motivated and inspired to come in. That's right. And they had your back. They respected the work that you did. They weren't crooks. Yeah. They weren't corrupt. Yeah. 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 And if you did the wrong thing, if you made a mistake, you were pulled aside. Exactly. We mentioned um, uh, uh, um, Loon, Paul Mager, and I think we've two of us sitting in a room and it'd be a miss of us not to not to mention uh, mention Paul. Terrific influence. Uh, yeah. He was my supervisor for uh, I think ten years, and yeah. uh, he was one of those ones that you didn't want to get on the wrong side of him. Hence no. the uh, nickname the Loon. <laughs> um, and I, I'd been uh, I'd, I'd been uh, chastised by him a, f- a, a few times. I think we all were, but. <laughs> yeah, we, you, yeah. If you missed out, you must be very yeah, good. We all were, but and that's fine. What what I respected about him, and when we talk detectives, this is what I liked about someone like <clears throat> Paul Mager. He could be sitting there minding his own business. I could be working on a job for six months, and I'm thinking I don't need Paul Mager. But then when the shit hit the fan, and the problem was, I could go speak to Paul, drawing on his experience. And I I, I think he was the longest serving person at the time he retired, longest mm. person. Uh, serving person in homicide, you could go to him and he would draw on his experience with that calming um, take on it that I've seen this before, this is what we did last time, yeah. that type of thing. That's, a, that's, that's the experience, isn't it? That's right. And yeah. look, it's such a blessing to be able to have someone like that you can go to. Yeah, yeah. And contribute it, to it later on in your service. Yeah, yeah. Because there is a pressure investigating the homicide. You feel the pressure. The say, say you don't, I don't think you're embracing what you're actually doing. But to have that sort of experience sitting there as someone that you can go to is really beneficial. That's right. Yeah, yeah. And they're not going to belittle you. Yeah. That yeah. was another thing too. They're not going to make fun of you. They're not going to pump their own weights up yeah, yeah. by putting you down. Yeah, yeah. And that's often the problem with people, you know, in an alpha environment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah we're all here to help. We've all yeah, got a similar yeah. goal. Yeah. And yeah. that creates leadership. That's, that, lead, that's what, that mindset is the result of being led. It's not the result of just being told what to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <coughs> Very good point. You are smart. Maybe you should have been an accountant. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> maybe your father was right. Yeah. Now, I can't, uh, I, I can't let uh, anyone leave this without asking the question, and uh, I, yeah, I want you to be honest in your answer. With uh, detectives, there's a lot of fictional detectives in the mm. movies, TV shows, in the books. Who do you identify with? Oh, God. Yeah, it gets to the point sometimes where you didn't want to watch the police shows. I saw Breaking Bad, ultimately. My wife was trying to watch Breaking Bad. It's a great show. I don't want to watch drug dealers. I don't want to watch bloody drug dealers. But um, <coughs> what a terrific show. 
<laughs> I'm glad you said that because <laughs> I didn't want to watch it for the same reason. Yeah, and then it I was started just watching a fantastic it, I just show. Binged. Yeah. Well, I didn't watch it for years. But yeah. ultimately, because it was about so. drug dealers. How yeah. could you be interested in drug yeah, dealers? Yeah, I, I, I want to watch the chick fight. I don't know. Yeah. Any of that. People yeah. make yeah. it. I don't want to. I don't want to have that shit when I come home. I just last thing I want. But I, I read a series of Bush about it, uh, a series of books um, uh, about a detective named Harry Bosch. Yes. And I can't even think who the author is now. He's just put a new one out. I heard him on the radio the other day. Um, very good. Very good. And there was another series of books. I'm a bit angry. I always saw myself as Harry Bosch. You're uh, stealing Harry Bosch. I'm just saying I was the person <laughs> I admired. But, he, he, but he, I, yeah, and I, I can see the I can see the very obvious um, the the obvious similarities with yourself. Um, no, you know? but that that I think what we identify with that type of detective, he has his flaws. Yeah. Uh, but he the the heart's in the right place. The and, heart's in the right place. Yeah. And. Sometimes he recognises the limits of bureaucracy and the impact that can have on actually just getting the job done ethically and properly. Yeah, yeah, a, 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 good, way, a good way of putting it. Another interesting uh, police show while we're on it is The Wire. Have you seen The Wire? I've heard about it. I haven't that, it. That's interesting because it, <coughs> it, it, it taps into... You've got the detectives, and I understand where they come from. They've got the criminals, but they've also got the politics involved in, in policing. It's something that, uh, now that you're retired and probably not doing anything uh, specific, um, maybe you should sit down and watch that. The, I will. The Wire. The Wire. Will. You'd I'll enjoy will. it. I, I think it would be a miss of me with all the experience that you've got, advice to anyone joining the, joining the police force. I never regretted a day that I had in the cops. Once I think I appealed a couple of people over a job, and it was at the homicide squad actually, and it was just not long, after I left, yep. not long before I left. And that was the only bad day I had because they were on the job legitimately while I'm appealing. Yeah, um, yeah, that was the process. I never had a bad day in the job, cops. Yeah. If you want a job, as we were saying earlier, where you can go to work and you don't actually know what you're going to be doing that yeah. day, fantastic. Mm. It's a good cause. It's all for a good cause. Um, it goes through various ebbs and flows throughout your career. I think I've I worked through about three or four major changes yeah. in administration and the way things are done. And that can be exceptionally frustrating. The more you go up in the service, the more politics becomes involved, where systems overtake outcomes. And that's extraordinarily um, frustrating. Mm. Where, you know, getting the job done really isn't that hard. But the number of barriers that are thrown in your way relative to, I'm not talking about career progression, I never I never applied for a job higher than superintendent that I, when I left on. But there are a number of barriers that are thrown. You know, the, the, the different competing interests between management and operatives mm. is, is very, very frustrating. And the way authority is used sometimes just to take the enthusiasm out of people. You know, if you bear with it, now like I said, if you want to be a policeman, you've, or oh, I've been in trouble for saying mm. that, if you want to be a police officer, and you've got that altruistic sense for adventure. Um, you know, go with it. But um, any police force is simply a vehicle for you for that particular, uh, for that nature, for that nature that you have. And and police forces everywhere are human constructs, and they have all the limitations of a human construct, a human organisation. Mm. Um, they don't. I don't, think, I don't think I've ever seen... Well, I've seen a couple that work very, very efficiently. But certainly here, they don't all operate as efficiently as they could. Um, the bigger they get, the more competing interests there are. Um, the more... Uh, and you, you alluded to it earlier when we had the new homeless... And all those different alpha males came in and from different yeah. parts of the place. And there's all this competition. And it's got nothing to do with getting the frigging job done. But it takes over... Yeah. The, and, and I've seen the whole organisation become victim to those silly competition. Com- competition. You know, we're, we're sure. Egos and ambition. Mm. And yeah, that's one of the saddest things about the cops. I think it's just, you know, if you just, if everyone sits there and just concentrates about getting the job done as best as they can possibly do it, what other 
what else do you need? If you can show yeah. you can do the job and you can do the job well, why, why is there all this other competition? Yeah, it, it shouldn't be the competition. We all should be pointed in the It's, in the, in it's the just same human direction. nature, but yeah. it's just, it, yeah. it's very frustrating. It's hard to uh, compartmentalise. It's just ultimately the cops is a bureaucracy. You're working as part of a bureaucracy. With your specific jobs, someone's going to hand you the baton just like a relay race. Grab the baton, do the best with your baton while you've got it, and then hand it over to somebody else yeah. and you can't worry anymore. Yeah, yeah. No, very <laughs> philosophical. <isn't it? laughs> very philosophical. Look, anyone that comes on this show, they come on because I've got respect for the, what you've done in the in policing. No, it's very flattering. We haven't worked together for 20 years. What, what I, the, the point I would like to make is that what I respect about you in policing, that uh, I was in the local area detectives when you were in homicide and you guys would come out on, on different murders or whatever and I got to work with you. But you had the focus of the job you had the emotion attached, but you also made the job fun. And uh, I think that's a quality that's needed in detectives because if, if you don't have all those qualities, you miss, miss the point. So you were focused on what needed to be done. You knew how to do it. You were smart, and, uh, but you also made the job fun. You, could, you, you knew when to take the pressure off and, and have a laugh because I think that's the only way we get through, get through homicide. So... Thanks for the influence that you've had on my career and uh, 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 I, I'm sincere in this that uh, when I saw the way you guys operated in uh, in homicide I thought I wanted to be part of that and that was that uh, North Region homicide that you're a big part in so it's been a pleasure talking to you. Um, I think we could go on for hours. I know we could go on for hours yeah. with the different stories but uh, thanks very much so uh, really appreciate it. Coming from a person such as yourself Gary, thank you very, very much. It's very, very flattering. Cheers Lynchy. All thank the best. Thank you mate. All the best. Ta. The life of a homicide detective is not the norm. Lynchy certainly has an interesting catalogue of cases. It almost seems surreal some of the things Ian uncovered during his investigations. I'm sure, after listening to Ian, you'd take comfort from the fact someone like Ian is investigating murders. You need a sharp mind and a sense of purpose and maybe even a bit of humour. That's what Ian brought to all the cases he worked on. Knowing how he operated as a detective, I was comforted by the fact that he was involved in the training and education of police in the later stages of his career, because he just got what policing was all about. He's only recently retired, and they are very big shoes to fill. Cheers. Next time on I Catch Killers, Steve Horn is the walking, talking encyclopedia of crime scene investigation. It's almost inconceivable the changes he has seen during his time as a crime scene investigator. I'm fascinated by Steve's stories and experiences. What it was like policing King's Cross during the Vietnam War, when the American servicemen would come here for R&R. &R. His time as a detective in the 21 Division, which was used as the sharp end of policing in the 70s. His work as a crime scene investigator during the Grainville train disaster, in which 83 people were killed fascinating stories around the many and varied crimes he has attended throughout his career. Catch you soon. I Catch Killers is published by True Crime Australia, produced by Claire Harvey from the Sunday Telegraph and Dylan Adams at Made in Katana. I'm now an investigative journalist at News Corp Australia, attached to the Sunday Telegraph. If you like the podcast, please subscribe to our newspapers.